Our next session is the social layers of Web3, leveraging community and culture to drive mass adoption. On the panel is Christina from Lens, Tara from CoCreate, Evan from Disco, and moderating the panel is Sam Ewin from Coindesk. Can we please welcome our panelists and moderators to the stage, please? Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be back here again. Thank you, Stello, for providing this conversation. Super excited to talk with these amazing people. Um, so I think we've had a really interesting time in the social side of the, de the decentralized movement in the last, really, two weeks, and then two months, and then two years, right? Um, it's been very exciting, I think, to see how the social layer has been evolving. and how much that's helped to, I think, create opportunities for people to have more conversations, connect with each other, and strip away a lot of the financialization and create a lot of more of the communication. So I'm pretty excited to have this conversation. So with us, um, to my, not my extreme, my near right is Tara Fung from CoCreate, Christina B, I'm not gonna give your full anon name, <laughs> from Beltramini. Beltramini. Okay, from, from Lens. Uh, and then Evan from disco.xyz. Um, I would love, and I really want to keep you guys to like max 45 seconds, because you all have amazing stories. Um, but just a quick intro about what you're doing right now and what you work on um, every day. Tara, I'll start with you. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sam. As Sam said, my name is Tara Fung. I'm the co-founder and CEO at CoCreate, and we're really focused on helping innovative brands, organizations, and creators unlock the power of community utilizing the tools of Web3. And that's very intentional in how we describe it, of utilizing the tools of Web3, because we've built an API platform that allows you to embed Web3-powered experiences within your existing web apps and mobile apps, and so all underneath the hood. My background personally is I'm a bit of a misfit, probably like many of the folks in the crypto and Web3 world. I've been doing everything from working at German automotive companies to financial services and alternative assets, and I found my way to crypto because I was so fascinated at these pockets of the internet where people were coming together and they were working on something because they felt like owners and they felt so connected to a brand. And so I decided to set out and build a company in this space. Christina? Hey, everyone. I'm Christina Beltramini. I lead growth for Lens Protocol. Uh, some of you here may have already heard about us. We're building decentralized social media. Um, the idea is we are a tech stack on which developers can build different experiences uh, with the notion that you know we own our social capital. So everything uh, fundamentally that Lens is built on is based on the idea that you own your followers, uh, you own your content, and you have the ability to choose which application uh, you'd like to use. And so, um, you know, it, we were built by the Ave companies, and the Ave companies was premised on the notion of financial capital. And we believe that uh, everyone has social capital, and that's something that we should all um, have sovereignty over. Amazing. Evan. GM, everybody, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy ETH CC week to come spend with us. Super excited to be here with some, uh, some peers and heroes of mine to talk about the people who we know and love in this space and love to enable. Um, so at Disco, we believe that you are the multifaceted center of the party, just like this disco ball, and you should reflect your identity to the world however you decide. We believe that the metaverse uh, means that you should be able to show up in any digital or physical environment and enjoy a personalized experience based on the parts of your that you choose to share. And so that is why we built Disco. We make it easy for you to carry around data written about you in your data backpack web app using the same keys you use on chain. We also make it dead simple for applications and services to issue off-chain credentials to your address so that you can own and control more than just piles of tokens. You can also be in charge of your preferred pronouns, your primary language, your memberships, proofs of participation, and interaction that happened throughout the ecosystem, not just, uh, not just your financial assets, because all of you are my cool new friends, full people, not just piles of tokens. Great, thank you. So I wanna start with the question that there are, in this last couple of months, we've seen a tremendous number of new social apps, both Web2 and Web3, come on 
uh, on board, right? And we've seen everything from spill to blue sky to threads, um, all the different sort of clones that Noster is spawning. There's so much stuff happening in Web 2 and then uh, in Web 3, and then there's a tremendous number of legacy Web 2 apps. We are also creating identities every day in our financial apps, in, our, in the games we play, in this e-commerce stores that we uh, sort of purchase from. And I kind of just wonder, when we look at the idea of digi digital identity and how that shows up for each of us, is this where we are supposed to be at this moment? You know, are we too late? Are we too early in the conversation around identity that all of you guys play roles in? Um, and I just would love to get each of you to give a quick take on kind of where you are or where you think we are in kind of the conversation around social layers. Um, Tara, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, Threads was so fascinating because everyone hated Facebook and Instagram until they realized they could get away from Twitter by going to another Instagram app. Our opinion on this is that the social fragmentation that's occurred over the last 10 to 20 years will likely continue occurring. People are finding more niche places that they want to be able to aggregate and collect. And in fact, I saw data recently that people engage more often in private messaging groups than public social media sites. And so our approach to this is not, hey, we think we need to have an opinion of who's going to win. Rather, we're building out a tech stack that allows a brand, a creator, an artist to say, I just want to be able to connect all of these disparate experiences. And I want to be able to have visibility and acknowledge and reward the actions that are happening across platforms. Because I think what Web3 enables is it enables the application layer, and I think you're going to have some really interesting thoughts on this, to be built on top of a community, where the, instead of having a community built on top of a platform and beholden to that platform. And so that's how we think about the space, is that the fragmentation will continue, and we just need to create these connected experiences across these platforms. And I think the fragmentation will continue. I completely agree with that. In small internet spaces, we're seeing consumer trends uh, towards that, right? Rather than, you know, optimizing for follows and likes, you're, you want a quality of, of curation. But if there is no kind of way to tie in your entire social presence, um, because you will be using multiple applications and you'll want to choose and engage uh, with different people in different spaces, but you shouldn't have to compromise on you know, your broader social graph and, and what is your social capital. And what we have seen with these big companies today is finally people are realizing the value that this is an asset. Um, and it's stuck in two or three large-scale centralized databases. And if I have a problem with them, I can't leave. Or if I want to go to a smaller community group and have a seamless way of bringing my followers and, and showcasing my activity and, and um, my social capital in these other platforms, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, and so now we're there in terms of we have a reason to care and we've seen why, which is great. We're not there in terms of the actual blockchain and, and building these seamless experiences and, and, and the ultimate vision, um, but I remain really optimistic. I am too, for sure. Uh, but I will say that I think we are a little bit late to this party, meaning that you know, right now, if the only thing I know about you is, let's say, your Ethereum address, the only thing I know is how many tokens you have. Um, and so the coordination games we can play together are group chat with bank account, like a multi-sig. We can play OpenSea collection management. Uh, we can play casino. Um, but the range of activities we can coordinate together knowing only financial assets are pretty limited, right? What language do you speak? What time zone am I in? Are you an engineer? Have I ever planned a party? So if we want to play more complex coordination games, like social interaction, like finding cozy spaces and communities, discovering one another, we need to know more about one another, which means we need more data. So from an identity perspective at Disco, we think a lot about what does it mean to find other people when our desire is more than just financial transaction. Um, so one of the challenges that we're running into in Web3 right now is that we have all become atonic, atomic self-sovereign units unto ourselves with our keys, totally independent, but then how do we find each other? 
Uh, and so discoverability is, you know, I think becoming an interesting challenge for us now. When I enter a DAP, how do I find my homies? Unless we are looking for the handles that we use on other platforms, the behaviors that we both might do out in the world. Um, so that's what we're very excited about enabling now, is that your, your ability to express yourself with your keys should encompass all of the traits and preferences you want to share, not just those that are explicitly financial. So I want to pull a little bit on what you just said, right? We want more data. We want to own uh, our own experiences a little bit more. We want our own platforms and ideally have those be composable across other platforms. You know, when I think of some reasons, like, like Tara, you guys were just involved in creating wallets for the events app for Harry Styles for one of his events. And in a single night, 5,000 people were able to get wallets. That's great. Right? When I think of every single time, you know, Mr. Beast posts a video, we're in hundreds of millions. You know, Christina, you have, I think it's 50 something thousand followers on Lens. You are a, an alpha in your community, but 50,000 is still in the media world, a relatively small number. Evan, I'm not sure how many users are on Disco, tens of thousands, right? We're, we're at numbers that are still pretty micro from a media perspective. Right? We all saw threads become 100 million plus users in less than five days. And it's because of the power of a Web2 platform and the aggregation of information. And I guess I'm interested in, uh, and I said this yesterday, like I hate the, the phrase, we need the next 100 million users, because I think most people want liquidity out of them. And that's really why they say that. Um, as opposed to, we want relationships with them, we want to get to know them better, we want to be able to keep people out of our lives who we want to avoid. So how do we do this at scale in today's market where our, like, our audiences primarily are pretty lazy? They don't want to do a lot of the work. And so what are, what are the things that you guys are seeing that maybe are the insights about how do we bring more people to actually want to play the game? Evan, we'll start with you. Build stuff that does things. Right? We have trained an entire global ecosystem of people to expect to be paid to do unnatural acts for a short period of time and then to receive a massive incentive. We have created the civil problem that we are battling against in its most extreme form now. And so when we think about, you know, the next hundred million onboarding them, I must ask the question, to where? For because why? Right? You know, just because rugging retail is a, you know, a regular occurrence doesn't mean that more liquidity is the answer forward. And so what we think at Disco is that we deserve some fun. We deserve to be able to use our keys and our self-sovereign capabilities to do you know, activities that are relevant to our lives as human beings, whether those are social or professional, whether it's about learning and discovery or rolling with the homies. Um, and so you know, there is also an abundant need to sell block space. You know, the NFT market's not what it used to be. Same with governance tokens. We're not, you know, selling food tokens this season, at least not so far this year. And so, you know, we've got abundant block space across L2s. We have a need for apps with utility that require more data from their shared backend. And so I think the logical answer here is build experiences that people do not merely tolerate, but actively enjoy. And it's not another Twitter-like experience on the blockchain with NFT uh, bells and whistles. If I have to see another one of them, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be very upset. But I was at TikTok uh, in 2019. And so this was back when um, no one thought that, you know, Instagram influencers were going to go across to a new application because, again, people are lazy and there was that stickiness and they already had their brand and their followers. And But what did emerge was a new class of creators because there was a new content type, but there was a new way to get discovered. And so when I think about bringing the next 100 million into uh, Web3 Social, we need new experiences. It's not going to be these skeuomorphic, you know, another YouTube another Twitter, another Facebook, you need to be unlocking real value and showcasing that value to creators. And so when we're finally able to bring the technology to, to where it needs to be, and I'm particularly excited by the composability aspect, and uh, we call this programmable social, and being able to really create something that is truly different uh, and unique uh, for creators is when we'll start to see them bring their followers and ultimately uh, more mass adoption. So we have the tooling. Uh, we just need a little bit of, of time uh, to build these different types of experiences. 
Yeah, and the thing that I would add is our approach is to meet people where they are already are, you know, not try to get them to do something that they aren't already doing necessarily, um, but to meet them where they are. So in the case of the Harry Styles concert at Slane Castle, Events app was the application, the app that people would use to get their tickets and then to go and find parking and to go merch. And so they were already there. And so they just embedded in that app the ability that someone could have a wallet automatically created for them so that now they can post event if they want to follow up with points that can be used for booking of additional um, tickets in the future that can be given a memento that lets them know, hey, I was at this iconic concert, Harry Styles at Slane Castle in Ireland. And so it just opens the relationship, but it didn't ask someone to go somewhere else. It was like, you're here, you're already here, you're already doing this thing. So that's what I think is really exciting is because again, communities can be the base layer and applications can be the top layer and communities can migrate and evolve and plug into different applications given the power of Web3. I think that allows us to be more distributed and just, again, meet people where they already are. So I told all of you that I'm gonna try to poke some holes in this part of the conversation. Let's go. <laughs> So, you know, let's use both TikTok and Harry Styles as the example, right? I, TikTok was a client of mine at the same time that you were there, and it was amazing to see the rise of. But TikTok was very simple. TikTok was one that, yeah, you had to learn how to edit within the app, but it was very, you know, it was more, even more so than YouTube or Instagram, for example. It was shows who you are as you are in all of your silliness, in all of your DIY nature, in all of the whatever. And the algorithm did a tremendous job at bubbling up creators to people. But there was also a, you know, as people heard about TikTok, they got on TikTok. We have not yet had a moment where as people heard about X, they got on X for social uh, when it comes to Web3. I also say when I look at the Harry Styles experience, there was 80,000 people at the event, 5,000 created a wallet. So we're still sub 10% of people want, even wanting to play, even when we're saying, hey, we're going to give you stuff, right? Um, we're not saying we're giving you free money. We're not saying you, we're going to, you know, create value. We're just going to say we're going to create relationship and, and community. I would argue that when, you know, the watermelon sugar trend on TikTok happened for Harry Styles, it was much bigger for him than whether he can connect to 5,000 people directly at, at an amazing show. And I think that's the thing I keep struggling with, which is, is it going to take the fact that Adam Mosseri at Instagram is a decentralized, de decentralized maxi in how it will build his business, right, at, at Threads, or that Elon talks about it, or that Jack Dor Dorsey talks about it, but they're coming from a perspective of privilege of saying we have hundreds of millions or billions of users that we can then give something to. Like, each of you are building platforms that is, is coming from the bottom up, right? And you're actually going against people who are saying, at the turn of a dime, I can get 100 million people to come onto a platform. So is that, do you guys look at that as opportunity, or do you look at that as a big challenge? Evan? I look at this as an incredible opportunity because I think that the, you know, take the Threads example, um, they are operating in, from a very different perspective as all of us as builders because their problem is retention, not adoption. And so when I look at, you know, Threads as an example, it seems like a fascinating Hotel California funhouse. You thought you left? Surprise. Mark Zuckerberg is actually behind the door that you're walking through thinking that you're leaving. And so Activity Pub and Fediverse afford the opportunity to try to leave an app, but actually have eight doors that Mark is standing behind. So the ability to, you know, change the idea of egress. Um, in the same way that sort of, you know, Apple's branding about privacy helps to check that box with consumers, I think that Threads very intelligently looked at the likes of Lens and, you know, our peers here and saw, aha, these, these elements slap for the people. Maybe we can try them out ourselves and handle sort of an, an opposite challenge of retention. Um, I think that there is a, a very, you know, interesting challenge in what we're discussing here and that it really comes down to UX and incentives. So we all know that people are willing to forego unbelievably challenging and pretty sus UX for the right incentives. I know some of you have used the front end of Curve Finance and so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and so then it's just a question of, you know, is the journey we are asking people to do too far from the journey they were on? 
is the incentive that we give them at the other end sufficient to inform their momentum, that activation energy barrier? And I think that's simply it. Um, so, you know, we've seen historical examples, you know, for example, I think in, yeah, in early 2020, Live Nation did the first Web3 activation on site at the Okeechobee Music Festival, and 20% of festival attendees not only completed the activation, but ended up spending money afterwards. Um, so generating, you know, revenue in a place that was not uh, apparent before and creating data about how people moved through the physical space that did not exist. And so I think as we, you know, as we learn through these experiments, you know, leaders like, like the co-create team introduce different forms of this kind of engagement in person, it's just a matter of, you know, honing that moment because we see glimpses of it here and there, but at the end of the day, it is a human-centered question of what is the journey with, you know, sufficiently low friction to be tolerable and what is the incentive that we can pull people over with. Um, and I think to Christina's earlier point, the unique capabilities of Web3 give us way different incentives where we can not only find, you know, farm for, for yield, but we can farm for vibes in our community by incentivizing behaviors that are meaningful. Right, but you can't pay rent with vibes. Right. right. You can't pay rent with vibes. That's and, true. And you vibes can't is pay, also not a marketing strategy. You can't pay rent with vibes. However, if your business, for example, is able to save money on the data storage that they are managing by relying on data that is brought to their front door by the user, if they are able to minimize their risk of holding PII on their servers to be able to provide personalized experiences, then we start to you know, explore where are these places where it actually can make business sense. So Christina, I mean, you guys are really building something that allows platforms to create whatever platform they want on top of your data. And that, that to me is a very exciting thing. That, and I think something that, that the Threads team said, which I think, thought was really smart, is whoever builds the best features will keep the, the folks in, right? So even though they can be decentralized and you can go to any app you want, it's gonna be a features game at that point. So what are you seeing as the opportunities for the folks building on top of Lens right now as, or the recommendations you're giving them of how to generate new users and keep users in? Yeah, so I'll quickly tie on um, your first spicy take. What we've um, learned as well is that no one really cares about how their data is used if the UX is good at the end of the day. But what, where Lens does it differently is that you're actually able to see the value of your content and what you're putting online. So that's slightly different to the data. It's I'm a creator and effectively what I am is I'm a digital entrepreneur. And now I'm building my business on platforms where I'm not actually able to see the analytics or make proper business decisions uh, on how I grow. And that's a huge limiting factor. And when you listen to what um, Adam says from Instagram, they're focused on creators first because they know that creators are the retention strategy for Instagram and for Facebook and now for threads. And they've done an incredible job of, of trying to um, bring creators over, but the monetization angle just isn't there for them. They're all publicly listed companies uh, at the moment. They've, they're gonna go from giving 90% of their revenues to being forced now to give 55% of that to creators. And that's not even all creators. That's a very, very, very small portion if you hit all the different qualification metrics. And so what makes us particularly excited on Lens is you can post a piece of content and actually monetize that directly as a post. So we call this um, user-generated collectibles. And that's something that a lot of the applications on Lens um, are playing around with, toying with the fact that you can finally own uh, your monetization, but also you can own your followers and take them with you throughout the ecosystem. What's interesting now is you have a world where people can actually leave um, at the drop of a hat. So you're essentially a liquid citizen uh, within a bigger social network. And so for these applications building on Lens, you can build great experiences, but at the end of the day, you actually need to have your own community. You need to have your own a &R team that's onboarding users, that's listening to users, that's really creating a product that is valuable. Um, because even with, we have 110K profiles on Lens and it's a good sample size to test, but even with um, you know, having an automatic you know, 20 or 30K uh, MAUs and DAUs, you really need to still retain them and you need to be listening to your users and building a differentiated product. And Terry, your team really works with brands in this space. How are, like, how are you teaching them to look at the communities on Disco, the communities on Lens, and saying, here are valuable citizens that we can now align to because we know their on-chain behaviors. Like, we have the opportunity to know them a little differently than we would if we were buying demographic data. Are you thinking about 
the fact that they are exposing a lot. Someone who's collecting a, a creator asset on Lens is a, is a psychographic data point that might be really interesting to a brand that wants to talk to folks who really support creativity. So how are you looking at these tool sets as a way to bring more people in? Yeah, in the brand space, I mean, given your point you made earlier, Sam, that those who are engaging in Web3 native experiences, it's a very small cohort. It's not an interesting number for most brands. And so they aren't coming to us and asking us, how do we get access to this Web3 native community here or there? What they are saying is, how do we grow, reward, and engage our existing audience and change them from an audience that's just consuming to a community where people are actually connected together and they actually want to have input and say in what we're doing and they give a shit about what we're doing. And so that's why the approach we've taken is we create NPC wallets for folks. Anyone can connect their self-custodial wallet as well, but for the most part, only 20% of the individuals that are part of the brand programs we support have connected a self-custodial wallet. So most of the individuals, they don't have this on-chain data elsewhere. Rather, they're starting to engage with the brand across the brand's web app, across the brand's mobile app, on Twitter, on Instagram, at live events. And what we're trying to do is to enable a brand to create a connected experience that acknowledges and rewards someone's behaviors across all of these different platforms and, experience, and places. And also to, and this is beholden to the brand, to say I actually want a different relationship. I actually don't just want an audience, I want a community. And a lot of the brands I talk to, particularly the bigger, more established ones, I press them on this because I'm like, you don't actually want a community because a community has voice and you just want them to listen to you. <laughs> and you don't necessarily want for your community members to talk to one another. But in a world where social media is becoming more fractured, where discovery is very difficult, if you don't have people who really care about what you're doing and feel connected to what you're doing, they're not gonna talk about you. And if I'm not talking about a brand on that private messaging group, guess what? Most of the people in that private messaging group are gonna scroll through whatever Instagram ad and not pay attention to it. And so we're not focused primarily on saying, hey brand, tap into existing Web3 native communities. We're talking to brands about, hey, this is how you actually create a different relationship with your audience and create more continuity across all of the touch points you're having with those folks. All right. But with that, we could keep going on. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you all for sharing your insights, your energy. What you're all building is incredible. You should all follow them, talk to them after this. And with that, we will say thank you and goodbye.